Hi, this is Craig from WPI's robotics program. In past videos, we've looked at how to use analog sensors to measure angular rotation. In this video, we're going to look at how we can use digital sensors to measure the same thing. We're going to start by looking at regular shaft encoders. This is an example of a regular shaft encoder made by VEX. It's got a shaft that turns a wheel on the inside. On the wheel are a series of holes uh, with a LED on one side and a light uh, uh, detecting diode on the other side. And as the wheel rotates past the LED, the light uh, falls on the detector or not. And so you get a series of pulses or ticks, uh, so they're sometimes called, uh, that are the output of the sensor. If you keep count of the number of ticks or pulses, you can figure out how much the shaft is rotated. If you're also keeping track of time, you can then tell how fast the shaft is rotating as well. So these pulses or ticks are simply digital output. The output goes from a low value to a high value, let's say 5 volts, and back to a low value, zero again. This encoder outputs 90 pulses or ticks per revolution. So one time around, we'll generate a pulse stream of 90 pulses. Other encoders, for example, the encoder that's built onto the backside of this motor and transmission have different numbers. This one, for example, outputs 360 pulses per revolution. Other encoders will have powers of two as the number of pulses per revolution, um, 128, 256, 512. The more pulses that you have per revolution, the better the resolution of the encoder and generally better resolution uh, is something that you want. An encoder such as this one for the VEX is useful for uh, mobile desktop robots, small uh, robots of that nature, uh, but this being made of plastic uh, is generally not going to be suitable for use on an FRC robot. You're going to need uh, a much more rugged uh, encoder, something like this. So with our digital encoders, we get a pulse or, or a series of pulses as the shaft rotates. How can we use that pulse to determine the direction of rotation? We can, we can certainly count the pulses to get uh, how much rotation we've uh, seen, but we probably also want to know the direction of rotation. So how can we do that? Well, the pulse itself doesn't tell us anything about direction. It's symmetric. So, if we want to know the direction of rotation of the encoder, we need some additional information. This is handled by adding a second track to the encoder, as shown here. The holes, or the light and dark areas, for the second track are offset from those of the initial track. We can see that we're going to need two of everything, two light sources, photo detectors, and associated circuitry. What this gives us is two pulse trains as the wheel rotates but those two pulse trains are a little out of phase with each other. More specifically, they're 90 degrees out of phase with each other. Since that's one-fourth of a complete cycle, this leads to the name of this type of device. These are called quadrature encoders. Okay, so how does the addition of the second track help us determine the direction? Let's look at the following picture to help. We can see two sets of waveforms here. There's an upper set of two waveforms, A and B, and there's a lower set of waveforms, A and B. Note that the upper set of waveforms is what we'll see if the shaft is turning to the right or counterclockwise. The vertical line labeled 1, we see the A output going high. This is called the leading edge of that pulse. It's at this point that you would adjust your counter, let's say adding 1, because the shaft is rotating to the right or clockwise. So how do we know the shaft is rotating clockwise in this case? To answer that question, you need to look at the B signal. Notice that at that time, at time 1, the B signal is low. Now hold that thought and let's now turn to the lower set of waveforms where the shaft is turning in the other direction. Time is advancing to the right. We're again looking for a leading edge on the A signal and we see one this time at time 3. So what is the B signal doing in this case? Ah, well look at that. The B signal is high this time. So we can tell which way the encoder's shaft is rotating by looking at the B signal whenever we see a leading edge on the A signal. In this case, B low, we would add one to the pulse counter. In the other case, when B is high, 
you would subtract one. Given a measurement of time and a count of pulses, we can also get an angular velocity out of the system or a rate of rotation. With our encoders, we need to note that these are relative devices. In other words, we're measuring a, a number of pulses, we're counting pulses. Uh, we have to start at some point uh, with zero. And so this begs the question of where in the full rotation of the shaft uh, is zero? Well, the answer is that there's no special place that's zero. So what you often will need is a separate uh, way of determining where zero is. There's a couple of ways of handling this. One is, is that on startup, your mechanism on the robot may automatically move slowly to a certain position and trip, let's say, a limit switch, and that this becomes the home position. And then when that mechanism trips the limit switch, uh, at the home position, then you zero your count and now you know where you are and you can move from there. Another way of solving the problem is to simply write your control code so that uh, you're assuming that your mechanism is starting in the home position always. And uh, then when, uh, on, when power up occurs, you can then start that at zero and, and move from there. So there's two ways uh, of handling that kind of situation. Now. You might want an absolute encoder. The uh, way that they work is very similar to what we've discussed so far with the relative encoder uh, and the tracks. Uh, the difference here is, is that we need more than two tracks. So let's look at how that works. This encoder wheel has eight tracks. Let's start with the innermost track. You can see that half of it is black and the other half is white. So using just that track, a complete rotation is divided up into two quadrants. The next track out has four quadrants, the next out has eight, and so on out to the outermost track that has two to the eighth or 256 quadrants. So with this encoder wheel, we can look at eight output signals, one for each track, and from those signals not only know which way the wheel is rotating, but know exactly how much it has rotated within one revolution. The microprocessor has to read all eight of the encoder output signals, but no counting of pulses is needed in this case. Each time the signal line corresponding to the outermost track changes state, all eight signal lines are read, and from that, the microprocessor can discern the exact uh, rotational angle of the encoder within one revolution. You don't have to keep track of pulses, and so that makes this then an absolute encoder. Finally, some encoders have what's called an index pulse. There's an extra track that will have one single hole in it, let's say. Uh, and that is used to basically say, here's my zero position on my encoder. So different encoders will have different numbers of tracks, uh, may or may not have an index pulse, may or may not be absolute encoders. So you need to look at the spec sheet carefully and determine what kind of encoder you've got or you need to look at uh, your, your situation and determine what kind of encoder do you need. The last type of encoder that we're going to talk about is what's called a gear tooth sensor. This is a sensor that, as the name implies, detects the teeth of a gear that go by. So you can imagine a gear here and the, the teeth of the gear are going to go by this face. Right? And the way this works is that the encoder, uh, the sensor, it's, I should say, has uh, some magnets in it and some uh, circuitry for detecting magnetic fields. Uh, again, these are typically Hall effect based sensors. And as the tooth of the gear goes by the face of the sensor, it distorts the magnetic field in the vicinity of the sensor face. And the circuitry can detect that distortion, so it's able to to read that gear, going, gear tooth going by and, and therefore generate a pulse that's associated with each one of those gear teeth. Like the other sensors that we've been talking about, you might have uh, a single channel, in which case it can't tell which way the gear is rotating. If you want to be able to tell that, then you'd need a quadrature version of the same kind of sensor so that you get two signals out and from that you can tell which direction the gear uh, teeth are, are rotating. A couple things to bear in mind with gear tooth sensors. 
Uh, the, gear, the end of the gear tooth needs to generally go pretty close to the uh, active face of the sensor, typically one to three millimeters. So you need to be prepared to mount this very, very close to the end of the gear uh, in your mechanism. The other thing that you need to bear in mind is the orientation. Uh, as I indicated, the gear teeth need to pass by the end of the sensor in this fashion, not, not this way. So that it, it matters which way uh, the, the gear is mounted. They're uh, pretty robust, uh, they're fairly inexpensive, uh, and great for certain kinds of applications. Okay, that's it for digital rotation sensors. I hope that this has been of help.